Alright everyone, so last week I was actually able to stay in this seat for the whole service, so we're going to try it again, uh, not my normal. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 3 is where we're going to be today, and we're taking a look uh, again at Moses uh, and the story of Moses th for the next several weeks, but more uh, in line with this is not only just the, the story of Moses as, as a piece, but we're looking at some of the key issues that arise in the church that are tough for us to talk about. Um, and they arise in Moses' story numerous times. And so we're going to take a look at this uh, topic today uh, that I think is maybe one of the biggest issues in the Church of America today. Um, and and it's, not, uh, it's not an issue that goes away easily. It's not an issue that is, it has an easy solve as far as, uh, I mean, the, the answer is pretty simple. It makes sense, but getting people to do it is the tough part. Um, and, and we can see that in the story of Moses. Today we're going to be reading in chapter 3 um, a couple of different sections there, but uh, later on in the story of Moses and in the story of the Exodus, we find the people of Israel uh, struggling with the key issue uh, once again. And then later on, after the Exodus, even when they're in, in the land and, and following a whole new leader, uh, throughout the next 600 plus years, the Israelites struggle with this one very key issue. And so when Solomon uh, constructs the temple and they dedicate the temple uh, to the Lord, God addresses this to the people. Um, he says, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal, heal their land. Um, and there is this promise from God um, that he wants us to turn to him. And that's the key issue in, in what we're looking at today is, this idea that we live our lives so many times as the church, we live our lives so many times as individuals without pausing uh, to put God in his rightful place. I mean, head knowledge-wise, we put God in his rightful place, which is first, right? We all know that God comes first. Um, <clears throat> that's the easy... <clears throat> excuse me. Just a minute. <clears throat> that's the easy answer is that God comes first. But if we were to take the evidence of our lifestyles, is that the case? Um, are we living that out? Are we exemplifying that truth that we proclaim? And that's the question uh, that we need to wrestle with today because the church, we, we don't oftentimes do a good job of living out um, our relationship with God as far as putting him in his rightful place. So with that said, uh, Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, uh, we read, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. If you skip down with me to verse 14, I want to read that verse as well and tie it in here. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent you. In those verses in between, and just uh, understand, it was God calling Moses to go to Egypt and to uh, beseech on half, behalf of his people for Pharaoh to let them go. And Moses is coming up with excuses on why he can't go. Um, and in the middle of all of that, he says, who will I even say sent me? And this is God's reply in verse 14. I am who I am, and this is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent you. Father God, I pray that we would encounter the I am this morning. God, that we would encounter you in all of um, your greatness and goodness in our hearts, minds, and souls. God, that we would just put aside any other thing that's distracting to us, any other thing that lays in the path of, of putting our attention on you. And God, just help us to um, seek your kingdom, your righteousness and to realize that you are present, you are here, and you desire us to, to seek you with all of who we are. 
And God, I just pray that you would move in a powerful way in our hearts and in our lives as we, as we seek you. And so, God, I pray that your words would be heard, not mine. God, that your message of truth, your Holy Spirit, would be heard within each of us. And so, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O oh God. In Jesus' name. Did you know um, that a caterpillar has 228 separate and distinct muscles in its head? You knew that? Did you know that the average elm tree has approximately 6 million leaves on it? I feel like I know that in the fall when it's time to clean them up. Um, did you know that there are 150 different fish species just in the Great Lakes alone? And then worldwide, um, there's 28,000 different species of fish. The average cheetah has around 2,000 spots on it, and every single spot is unique. No two spots are exactly the same. And then there's the human eye. The human eye is made up of over 200 million working parts. It's the fastest muscle in your body. In the right conditions in the lighting and right lighting, humans can see a lit candle from 14 miles away. It's pretty amazing, right? Now, there's a lot of other nature facts that I could throw out there, and a lot of other uh, uniquenesses that we could put up there, and we could have a whole big thing of, did you know? Uh, by the way, referencing all of those facts came from this wonderful book of Odd Truths that I have at home. It's about yay thick, if you ever want to read it. It's great. Um, Titus has read it. He can attest to that. Okay, it's in Cincinnati right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. Anyhow, I give you all of those facts because whatever God's reason for creating with such diversity around the globe and in our local uh, lives and things that we see all of the time, there is so much diversity. And for whatever reason, God used all of that uh, diversity. And, 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 and aside from diversity, there's this intricate nature to what he has created. Uh, sure, the leaves on an elm tree seem pretty bland and normal, uh, but it's pretty intricate how they work and how they change. And when you look at a, a caterpillar, though Nevin is afraid of them and, and thinks that they're trying to kill him, uh, just understand they're very beautiful in their own way and very unique in their structure, and there's so much to them. And then, of course, there's the human eye, which that picture, by the way, is a little creepy, um, just a little bit. Um, but it's also very beautiful when you look at an eye and just understand that there is so much involved in there. And for whatever reason, God chose to create the world with so much diversity and with so much intricacy um, on all over earth and in our bodies and that sort of thing. Um, but all of it is to one point. And the reason for all of that is to draw glory unto himself. And I think we fail to see that sometimes. We get caught in the mundane and we forget how amazing everything is around us. And we forget that God created it all. And we forget how... Uh, privileged and blessed we are to have the functioning bodies that we have and, and all of the, the intricacies of how we live life. And again, God created all of that and, and breathed the breath of life into humanity. And we fail to remember that God has his hands in every little thing. Uh, in the New Testament, Jesus is teaching his disciples in the book of Matthew and he tells them, and he gives them this illustration, a parable if you will, and he, he says that... Uh, uh, the birds of the air, uh, you know, they, they, they don't work, they don't worry, uh, they just gather, and God always takes care of them. And he says that uh, Solomon, in all of his splendor and glory, the, the richest king in all of Israel's history, uh, had all of this gold and all of this greatness, and not one bit of his, of his greatness and his gold and his, his uh, kingdom could compare to the beauty of a simple lily uh, that God has created. And God has created all of this stuff intricately and uniquely um, for a reason. And it's to draw our attention to him. And yet, so many times, even as he has created it to draw our attention to him, we get caught up in all of the things that draw our attention away from him. We get caught up in so much. Um, we're called to worship God. Um, his art, his handiwork, uh, his creation all echo the truth that he is a glorious God. He's amazing. An amazing God. 
And there's no one like God. A lot of people try to compare things to God, um, but there is no one like our Creator God. He is the King of Kings, uh, which is a phrase that we use. He's the beginning and end, which is another phrase we use. Uh, he is the one uh, who was and is and is to come, also a phrase that we use. But what does all of that mean? Um, be real honest with you, sometimes I struggle to proper, properly respond to God um, and all of his magnitude. I get caught up in the everyday, just like everyone else. And I live in a world that's so bent on ignoring God, and we're so bent on just seeking our own pleasures or our own gains, and we ignore him. Uh, or sometimes the world just simply tolerates God. Would you agree with that? Sometimes the world just seems like they're just simply tolerating the idea of God. But you know what? There's a simple truth. God will not be tolerated. Um, he intends for us to worship Him. He intends for us to fear Him, which is a phrase that we don't really like too much in the church. The issue that I want to talk to you about this morning and open up the conversation as well is this very simple truth. And I, I said that, in my opinion, it's one of the biggest issues in the Church of America today, is we fail to see the sovereignty of who God is. We can head knowledge acknowledge that God created the world, and we can say with our head and with our mouth that he is first, but we fail to put him in that place and live accordingly. We fail to, to allow God's sovereignty to have the final say in how we make our decisions. We fail to let the sovereignty of God um, dictate our futures and our hopes and even our personality changes. And, and all of these things come into play and draw us away from God and, and, and make it so that we, uh, we ignore God. Uh, maybe it's not even by choice at first. It's just the busyness makes us ignore God. Um, but the truth is, is that we need to draw again and put God in his, draw unto God again and put him in his right place where he is first and everything else comes after that. There are so many things that we put first instead of God. And I think part of the reason that that is is because because I don't know how to explain it, but we don't see him right here. I mean, we can see God's work and God's movement if we actually pause and take time to do so, but it's not like your boss standing in front of you um, that's telling you what needs to be done today uh, and that sort of thing. And so uh, it's easy to instead pursue our own hopes, our own dreams, our own pleasures, our own uh, sustenance even, and, and our own plans instead of seeing who God is and what God wants for us. Um, and, and Moses is caught up in this. Last week we talked about how Moses uh, left Egypt under not great circumstances. He had killed a guy and then tried to cover him up with sand, tried to hide it. Um, but it was seen by some, just like social media today, finds out everything that we do and somebody's always watching. Big brother, right? Uh, but Moses is experiencing that, and, and these people, they saw Moses do this thing, and now he's a wanted man, and he runs. He runs from God. He runs from Egypt. He runs from Pharaoh. He runs from everything that he knows uh, to find something. And it's in the middle of all of that that God meets with him. And the, this story unfolds because he left Egypt in the, in the palace and all of the plushness of, of, of what could be Moses' great life. And instead he chose to, to run and hide because of his own impulsiveness and trying to work things out on his own ability uh, and his own failures um, just kind of dictate his new future. And then we come to this part, and Moses, I feel like uh, we miss it. Because see, what's happened is since he's left Egypt until now, is 40 years has taken place. Um, I had mentioned that he was 40 when he left Egypt. Uh, I turned 40 this summer. So add that number again. So two of me uh, put together, two of my lifespans. Anyone 80 in the room? No. Um, we don't have any 80-year-olds here today. <laughs> He's not even close. No. He's not even close. Uh, and so just understand that a lot of times at 80 years old, we think it's time to wind down in life. We think that it's time to, to sit back and be comfortable. And maybe Moses was starting to buy into that. He'd made a career. He'd made a family. He had married. He had started this life working for his father-in-law, tending to his flocks and his sheep and, and taking care of all of these things. And then God speaks to him. And it takes Moses a little bit of time to, to come to respond to God. Uh, he's curious, absolutely. When God starts to do an amazing thing, people get curious. 
and this thing that God is doing in front of Moses, no one has ever seen uh, before then or after then, I might add. I, I've never seen a burning bush, and I don't think anyone else has that I know of. Um, that's not consuming, I should say. We could light a bush on fire, and that's different. But Moses, it takes him a little bit to understand just what God's calling him to do and who God's calling him to be. And, and, and even then, when he hears what God's asking him to do and who God's asking him to be, he balks at the situation and says, no, thank you. I think he's been lulled into the, the normalcy of his own life and his own comfort, and he has no desire to go back to a place where he's a wanted killer. I think he's grown comfortable with his his family and his, uh, his workplace, and he has no desire to let God mix that all up. Uh, and it takes uh, a great movement of God uh, to change his mind. And so there are some truths that we need to wrestle with in the church, things that we maybe find hard to actually, actually admit to and apply to our lives. Maybe head knowledge, we'll admit to it, but to really admit it into our lives and let it change and transform how we do all that we do um, is a whole different story. I think so many times we want to let God into our lives on a limited basis and let God do the cleaning up process of what people can see, again, because we don't want to admit our failures, but we don't want him to change so much that he has control. Does that make sense? And so here's the thing. God calls to Moses out of this burning bush. And Moses, he, he's, he's curious, and he's starting to head that way. And then God says, don't come any closer because you are human, and I am God, and you really can't handle all of this. Um, and there is a lesson right there in and of itself. So many times we try to set ourselves up as though we're equals to God, that we have an equal say in his plan. Um, now, God gives us free will, don't get me wrong, but even in the middle of all of this his word is truth. His ways are, are greater than our ways. His thoughts are better than our thoughts. And so who are we to argue with God? And yet we do all of the time. Because we, for whatever reason, try to put ourselves on that same footing with him. And, and then there is this idea that is, that is started here in Scripture, and then it continues throughout Scripture, that God is holy holy, holy, not just once, but in triplicate, which is an Israelite way or a Hebrew um, way of overemphasizing this very truth. It's not just understand God is holy, but when we say it in triplicate, understand that it is the essence of who God is. The very core of who God is, is this, he is a holy God. And that means that he's set apart from the world. He's completely different than the world. There is no sin there. It is only righteousness. And, and it is only uh, the power of God uh, that, that can do that. We can't be holy, holy, holy. We cannot be completely uh, free and clean from all of our humanness. Only God can do that. And so uh, understand that God is holy. And, and, and even as I say that, again, head knowledge. We, we accept this as a church. This is the foundational teaching of the church. But to really let that impact our lives, to really understand that God wants us to be different than the rest of the world. He wants us to be set apart from the rest of the world. He wants us to be uh, drawn apart in, in so much of a fashion that people, when they look at us, they don't see a normal person. Now that seems uncomfortable. And, and we're not really ready as a church to do that. Matter of fact, the church over the last 10, 15 years has been really pushing, has been really, sorry, I thought you were calling me, uh, has been really pushing to try to be more and more relevant to our world around us. And hear me, I am a big fan of relevancy. The church has to be relevant to the world around us or the world won't listen to the message. Um, but we try to be so relevant that we change the message and we compromise on morals. We compromise our integrity. We compromise on uh, key words like obedience and, and trust. And we instead obey our own desires and we trust our own abilities instead of listening to what God would have for us. And so maybe the first piece of the puzzle, before God ever calls Moses to go back to Egypt, is he wants him to realize that he is a holy God. Don't come any closer, because I'm holy. 
You can't come any closer than this, Moses. Take off your shoes, as a matter of fact. It's not that you can't even come any closer. It's right where you're at is a holy place because you're in my presence. You need to take off your shoes because you can't, you can't defile this. You can't mess this up because I am God and I'm holy. And even as that's the introductory to what God calls Moses to do, I think in our own faith journey, we need to wrestle with that at the outset to understand that it's that relationship with God is also uh, an understanding that even though we're in relationship with him, he is the head. He is the holy one. He is the one that's set apart. And, and we need to put that into proper perspective and just lay aside our own um, ambitions and take off our shoes and just rest in his presence and let him speak truth to us instead of trying to dictate our truth to him. And so God calls Moses and says, listen, Moses, I've got a plan for you. I've got a plan for you, and it's, it's a big deal. Uh, I find it interesting, and I included verse 14 for us this morning, because this phrase, I am who I am, uh, this is what you need to tell the Israelites, I am has sent you. Uh, this phrase, and there's been a lot of biblical study on it, don't get me wrong, um, but there is this understanding that God is trying to teach that there is so much of his character and nature wrapped up in that statement. Uh, what I mean by that is he is trying to teach Moses a second piece of the puzzle. I am holy, I am set apart. Now, now that you've wrestled with that, Moses, and this mountain that you're on is going to be a unique place in your life. You're going to bring the people of Israel back here. You're going to worship here. I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments, all of this stuff. It's a pretty amazing thing that happens. But even in the middle of all of this, uh, I'm holy and separate, God is also communicating to him that the things that you care about pass away. You are a criminal. Okay, no big deal. I've got you covered. Uh, you're a wanted man? No, 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 no worries. Go back to where you're wanted and I'll, and I'll work that situation out. Um, you don't have power of your own ability to do this? That's okay, I've got it. Uh, I saw you when you were a baby in the Nile River. I saw you when you were an adult committing murder. I saw you when you were tending sheep for your father-in-law and I'm calling you Moses. It's kind of the story we get here and Moses is learning just how eternal God is. And sometimes we forget that lesson uh, because we don't put God in his right place. We head knowledge, again, and you're going to hear me say this a lot today, we head knowledge understand that God is eternal, that he was here before we were and that he'll be here after we are. But there's something to be said about his relationship with us in understanding his eternal nature. Um, God is so much bigger. He's so far beyond our time-encased um, lives of seeking air, food, sleep, and all of our dependency on those things. God is so eternal. Um, and, and, and understanding the nature of the fact that God is holy, set apart, but also eternal, without start, without end, and that we're all part of the plan. His plan from the very beginning was to love you. His plan from the very beginning was to have a relationship with you. His plan from the very beginning was for you to know him and to call his name and to be able to call him Abba Father. Uh, and, and, and this eternal God, he knit you together in the womb from the very beginning of your life. He knit you together uniquely. There's so much to be said about the uniqueness of each of us. I mean, I drew the attention of the eye, but we were to unpackage from head to toe, we are so incredibly unique. Um, and so understand that God has, has delivered you into this place for this time uh, very uniquely and, and very set apart for a purpose and a plan. And, and even as we understand that and God has gifted us and called us to unique things, understand that this truth comes in it or in with it is that if God has a plan for us and, and he has a unique uh, um, piece of this world and history for us to live in, why do we argue with him about his direction for our lives? Why do we argue with him about um, our own abilities? Uh, let me give you an example. So many times when God calls us to go and do something, like Moses being called to go and lead the people out of Israel, or Egypt, uh, we, like Moses, come up with reasons we can't do it. Um, Moses uh, says to God, hey, I can't do that. Um, I'm not very good at speaking to people. Why don't you ask my brother Aaron to do it? 
Um, and we see this conversation between him and God. We do the same thing. God, uh, he wants us to, to live uh, beyond our means. And what I mean by that is, is not going into debt. I mean, he wants us to live beyond our means of, of, of generosity towards other people. And he wants us to live beyond our means of, of fulfilling a, a debt of love to humanity. Uh, matter of fact, Christ, he says that uh, there should be no debt remaining amongst us except for the debt to continue to love other people, sorry, not Christ, Paul, the Apostle Paul uh, says this. And so just understand that we have this, this ongoing debt to love one another and we are to live that out in, an, in all of its entirety. And yet we tell God, well, okay, I'll love people as long as they look like me, act like me, uh, have the same socioeconomic standing as me or whatever it may be. Uh, but God, don't make me uncomfortable. Um, don't make me be the one who has to confront don't make me be the one who has to, um, you know, break the ice in this situation. God, you need to orchestrate all of that. And we argue with him about the job that he has for us. And we, we tell him that our plan is better than his. Or, or maybe it's not about God calling us to go and do something. Maybe it's about the very core of how we've been created. And we tell God that I'm not good enough. And we tell God that I, I don't have the gifts and talents or we compare ourselves to other people that God has created that have a, a better talent than us in a certain area. And we tell God that what he has created in us is not good enough and that it's junk. And yet the truth is that God created you uniquely and you're not junk and he has a purpose for your life and he has a plan for you. And so if we were to put God in his rightful place as the Holy One, if we were to understand just how big and eternal this great, awesome God is, then what we would find is that we have no leg to stand on in arguing with him. Because, sure, we might not be the best fill-in-the-blank singer, speaker, whatever it is, but God already knows that. And he's not asking you to do this on your own. He never told Moses to go to Egypt by himself. The promise was always that he'd be with him. There's this whole thing as Moses argues with God about doing it that Moses uh, is instructed by God, hey, hey, you're holding a stick. Throw that on the ground, why don't you? And see what happens. Now, any of us that have played in the woods with sticks, you know, you're just like, okay, throw a stick on the ground. It's going to just lay on the ground. He throws it on the ground and it becomes a serpent. To me, that is like God being cruel. And it's just not cool. And then God goes a step further and says, no, go ahead and pick up that snake. Um, no thanks. He does and it turns back into the stick. And then God, as if that wasn't enough, says, Moses, why don't you go ahead and take your hand and put it inside your cloak for a second? Um, what do you mean, like Napoleon? And he sticks his hand in there and then God says, okay, pull it back out. And when he does, his hand is covered in leprosy. And then God says, okay, now stick it back in there. And then he does, and when he pulls it out, it's, it's well. You see, God works unconventionally. And if he can do weird things like that, uh, to just indicate how much we need to trust him, how he has the actual control over our health and our well-being, how he has the actual, like, uh, ability to, to change everything in our world from the way that we would see it to the way that he would have it. Um, if we could just understand how great and eternal God is in that area, how much different would we live our lives? See, the problem is, is we think that we know more than God, but God is all-knowing. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 says, nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Nothing. And all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and it's laid bare before his eyes. Uh, and to him, we have to give an account for ourselves. That's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. It's a pretty powerful verse if you think about it. There's nothing you do that's in secret from God. And you have to give an account to him. And so if God can see all of this, he knows all of this, he is... Uh, he is there in, in our weakest moments, he's there in our strongest moments, and he sees just how weak our strong moments are and just how uh, incredibly weak our weak moments are. And yet he still loves us. He still forgives us. He still calls us his sons, his daughters, his loved ones. Then why would we not put our trust in him? 
Why would we not follow him wherever he wants us to go? Because he already knows our past, our present, and what lays in our future. And so just understand um, that not only is God holy, not only is he eternal, not only is all-powerful, but, or sorry, all-knowing, but he's also all-powerful. See, I think that's the hiccup. In our world today, we think that we have to work things out out of our own abilities. And we see so much stuff out of control in the world that maybe we think God doesn't have the power to do anything about it. That couldn't be further from the truth. In head knowledge, we would never say that. Um, but sometimes I think we believe that. That maybe God doesn't have this under his control like he should. Or like we think he should. But he does. His plan is not our plan. His ways, not our way. His thoughts, not our thoughts. And so we try to tell God how to work it all out. And it doesn't always go that way because his plan is different. And just because people are making decisions uh, that are choosing not to follow him and people are choosing sin and people are choosing wrong instead of right doesn't mean that God is still not in control and that God still won't have the victory because he will. He absolutely will. And so, if that's the case, once again I ask, then why? Why don't we put him in his rightful place as first? Why do we, why do we put ourselves first instead? People of Israel, they witness something amazing in the next couple of chapters in the book of Exodus. Moses, he goes to e Egypt and he asks Pharaoh to let all of the slaves go. And Pharaoh says, yeah, no thanks. And so Moses starts to call on God to do some pretty miraculous things. We call them the plagues of Egypt. And they're pretty amazing. Amazingly terrifying. Um, but amazingly powerful. Amazingly unexplainable. Amazingly out of our control. Amazingly, you're, uh, we can't replicate it in any way. It's just amazing that God can move in that way. And he does. And so finally, Pharaoh relents and they go and they're, they're, they're leaving Egypt and they come to the Red Sea. Pharaoh changes his mind, wants them back, pursues them with the army. And as if the ten plagues weren't enough to show his power, God just splits the Red Sea and they cross over on dry land. And then he brings it back together and he swallows up Pharaoh's army. And we see all of this greatness of the power of God I do not understand how the Israelite people then, in all of this, after they've seen it all, they create a, a golden calf, a Baal altar, and they turn their face away from God just because Moses is taking too long to talk to them. And we judge them. We judge the Israelite people for doing that. But we do it all the time. We put other things first instead of God. We put our timing first instead of his. And, and we fail to see how much God wants us to turn our attention and let, uh, to, to him and let him control the moments and the movements of our lives in a great way instead of us trying to dictate what our future looks like to just trust in him and follow his plan, his path. And so the Israelite people, they do this. Moses, he encounters them. Uh, they repent. Uh, there's, there's all of this, and then that's the story of the Israelite people for hundreds of years. Is they, they turn their attention to God for a while. God does pretty amazing things. They turn their attention back to themselves. And then they find themselves in a big mess. And then they turn their attention back to God. God does amazing things. They turn their attention to themselves. And they end up in a big mess. And the cycle continues and continues and continues. And so do we. And so do we. We have these victory moments in our spiritual lives. Moments where we met with God and we think that that is the moment. But God wants to be in all the moments. God wants to be a part of your struggles. He wants to be a part of your choices. He wants to be a part of why you do everything you do and how you do everything you do. So the biggest struggle of the Church of America today is putting God in the right place, and that is first place where he has a say 
in what we do. And he has a say in why we do it. And that's what the church has struggled with for generation after generation after generation. And though head knowledge, we can, we can admit that God is holy. And we can admit that God is eternal. And we can admit that God is all-knowing and God is all-powerful. Head knowledge, we agree with those 100%. Do we live our lives that way? Do we let God have total control? All right, so I want to open it up for some conversation for a moment. What is the hardest thing? I'm going to sit and listen after I ask this question. <clears throat> what is the hardest thing about letting go of our plan and following God's? So it's the giving up of control that's the hardest part. I would agree with that. It's hard to quit trying to work it out ourselves and to just let God work in those situations. Okay. Others? The unknown. Not knowing where he's taking us, why he's taking us there, what that's going to look like. We might be more willing to follow him and give him total control if we just knew the details. Yeah, <laughs> I would agree with that. <laughs> but so many times he just shows us that next step, right? And not the whole path. The unknown. Yeah, Yeah. Maybe, maybe giving up control is hard and not knowing what is in front of us is also hard, but, but we would still do it. We would still roll that dice if we just knew what you're asking me to do. Uh, sometimes it's our own fault because we haven't taken the time uh, or we haven't, we haven't sought it. Um, and sometimes it's just that patience of waiting for him to communicate to us. Anyone on this half of the room? Like from Aaron over? <laughs> nice. Nice. Well done, Abby. Well done. <laughs> And I think that you're not alone in that fear. You know, if I fully surrender to God, if I fully follow God, he's going to take me to Africa, and I'm going to have to live with some tribe somewhere that only speaks and clicks, and I'm going to have no resources, and I'm going to miss toilet paper immensely. And God, <laughs> I'm not ready to do that. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm just making an illustration there, but we like our comforts. We like... Uh, like-minded people to be around and that sort of thing. And so we, you know, and man, every time you read about somebody who's fully committed to God, he calls them off to some weird place or, or makes a martyr out of them, it seems like. But that's actually not the case in truthfulness. In church history, it's full of people serving him and following him right where they're at. But there is that fear of what if. What if he does call me to go there and do that? Wait, wait, pause. 
He's calling you to Africa to speak no. in. Okay. No, no, no. In my own, my And I think that's, that's how he more often works, actually. Um, and I've said this numerous times throughout the years of ministry. Show me where in the Bible God calls someone to do something that they're already able to do. More often than not, he says, hey, I've got something impossible for you to do. Here you go. Um, because he wants us to trust him more. And he wants us to see his power and his greatness in it. That sounds like a story I want to hear sometime. <laughs> All right. We're going to close up shop here and uh, continue on looking at things that are hard to talk about in the church over the next couple of weeks. But I just want to challenge you as we close up shop this week um, to maybe take some moments and draw aside from the chaos of what's your normal and draw aside from the everything else that, that draws your attention and wants to consume your time and just say, uh, just, just say in all honesty, God, this is, this is where you're at in my life and on the pedestal, on the, on the list of things, how do I make you first instead of here? And, and how, do I, how do I live that out every day? And if, and if you honestly feel like God is first right now, that's awesome. And then just, again, seek him out throughout this week throughout the time following and say, okay, God, what's next? Where, where, are we, where are we going next? What are we doing next? Who are we talking to next? What are you asking me to, to do? And, and then just follow that, trust that. As hard and unknown as that may be. So God, I thank you for your truth. God, I thank you that you never give up on us, even when we are murderers in the desert. You don't lose us. Your, your attention on us, uh, you keep it right there. And you still call us your son and your daughter. God, even when our sin seems overwhelming and our situation seems impossible, God, you are all-powerful, you are all-knowing, you are always there. And I thank you for that. So God, help me to put you in your rightful place in actuality. Help me to live with you driving the locomotive, God, and, and just taking it where it needs to be. And God, just we pray that you would continue to move amongst your people. As your word tells us you will do that, if we just seek your face, if we repent of sin, if we humble ourselves before you, God, then you're going to do something amazing. You're going to move in a powerful way. And we trust you, and we know that that's true because we've experienced it in the past. And so help us to get out of the way of it happening again in the future. And God, help us to come to you with, with the right heart, with the right mind, and with the right spirit. So I thank you and I praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.